Greetings and welcome back to Room 303, AP English, and the Roberts Lectures. Here we are in the poetry section. We now turn to, to Louisa Erdrich's Indian boarding school, The Runaways, her 1984 offering. Now, this one, some, some of the poems that we study in 303 elate us. Some of them challenge us with a different kind of feeling. And, and, and that feeling can sometimes be sadness, it can sometimes be disgust, it can sometimes be... Um, um, lugubriousness and all of those feelings are going to be a part of our study and our reading of this poem. This is a this is a sad poem on a number of counts, and we're going to have to ask why. But right away, I kind of want to I want to bring you to that. And of course, um, Erdrich's work and 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 um, Erdrich is is a poet for us that is so value valuable for us. In the same way that Leslie Mormon Silko's work is so valuable for us. Born in 1954, she is an American author of novels, poetry, children's books as well, right? She's part Native American as well as German, and it will be that Native American element that will factor so heavily in so much of her writing. She is, uh, some have argued, part of the second wave, they have, they have called it, of the Native American uh, uh, Renaissance. Um, and uh, in November of 2012, she was awarded the National Book Award for Fiction. Um, this poem, published in 1984, was the first, it came from her first book of poetry, um, Jack Light. To read this poem, we have to begin first with the footnote that's provided at the bottom of 762. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, I'm just reading it with you. Many Indian boarding schools were instituted for the education of Indian children. The principal aim of these schools was to inculcate European and English-based knowledge and ideals along with encouraging Indian children to forsake their own heritage. If any children left the schools without permission as runaways, they were punished when they were captured and returned. So that will be the backdrop for the, our poem now, Indian Boarding School, The Runaways. Home's the place where we head for in our sleep. Boxcars stumbling north in dreams don't wait for us. We catch them on the run. The rails, old lacerations that we love, shoot parallel across the face and break just under turtle mountains. Riding scars, you can't get lost. Home is the place they cross. The lame guard strikes a match and makes the dark less tolerant. We watch through cracks and boards as the land starts rolling, rolling till it hurts to be here, cold in regulation clothes. We know the sheriff's waiting at mid-run to take us back. His car is dumb and warm. The highway doesn't rock. It only hums like a wing of long insults. The worn down welts of ancient punishments lead back and forth. All runaways wear dresses, long green ones, the color you would think shame was. We scrub the sidewalks down because it's shameful work. Our brushes cut the stone in watered arcs, and in the soak, frail outlines shiver clear a moment. Things us kids pressed on the dark face before it hardened, pale, remembering delicate old injuries, the spines of names and leaves. Now, let's, I mean, there's just so many things happening in this. This is a real tour de force poem. Notice, for example, the poem is about runaways, and look at the last word of the poem leaves. Are we talking about the leaves off of Rithi's tree? Or are we talking about the leaves as in they, the, the attempt by children to leave, to get away? And the inability to leave or to get away, and the ways in which culture is somehow so oppressive. Granted, it's a beautiful thing in many ways. It provides us with all kinds of great blessings. There's a curse as well. There's a tyrannical element, isn't there? As uh, Jordan Peterson likes to talk about in his talks that so many of you have been uh, mentioning in 303. This idea that there is, there is a tyrannical element to culture, and of course when cultures collide, and of course in our nation's history, the native peoples and the ways in which their cultures have been largely forgotten, unable to ever return. We're going to hear all of that in this poem as well. Notice we begin with the word in the concept of home, and we immediately think of Robert Frost's Death of the Hired Man. The idea that home is the place where when you go back they have to take you in. Notice that here, Idrick is going to be playing with a, a, a different element of that concept. That 
the idea of dreams is as well a, a powerful part of what it is this poem is trying to suggest. The box cars, box cars, again, the verb, stumbling north in dreams. They don't wait for us. We catch them on the run. The rails, the, the, the railway tracks, old lacerations. Of course, here's the irony, right? It was the building of the railway out west in places like where we live, which allowed for the non-Native Americans, those who were, of course, coming, the explorers, coming west, allowed uh, that infiltration of an outside culture, which, of course, ultimately led to the extermination of a lot of Native culture. Right? Old lacerations that we love shoot parallel across the face and break just under Turtle Mountains uh, the, the, here at the uh, Chippewa, close to the Chippewa Indian Reservation in North Central North Dakota is being referenced here. Writing scars you can't lose, and that notion of you can't lose, that is to say there is no leaving. Home is the place they cross. This idea of juxtapositions of different kinds of understanding of home. Home might be the place where you have to, to live. Home might be the place where you long to live. Then there's a stanza break. And then, of course, we'll get to the runaways. The, the lane guard strikes a match and makes the dark is less tolerant. We watch through cracks and boards as the land starts rolling, rolling till it hurts to be here, cold in regulation clothes. Now, I want, to, I want you to put this in your notes at 2B because this is a powerful symbolism. The clothing in this poem somehow represents culture in some profound ways. Now, we're not... An, Unaccustomed to this, Shakespeare's Macbeth plays the same game. Go back and look at our lectures on that one. But notice we'll be playing a game here about, in some ways, what you wear defines culturally who you are and what you can accept, what you will accept, right? Notice, we know the sheriff's waiting at mid-run to take us back. There is no escape. We think of Sartre's no exit here. His car is dumb and warm. The highway doesn't rock. It only hums. And then this amazing simile like a wing of long insults. That's a compelling, compelling, subtle, very subtle uh, simile, and yet a powerful one, right? In other words, there is no escaping the insults that inevitably will be the dominant culture. And then finally, the worn down welts, welts marks made by constant hitting, of ancient punishments lead back and forth. That may be the heart of the poem, that may be the line many of you have said out loud, that's the line of the poem. It's so compelling with the word well, it's, it's a powerful word picture. We think immediately, of course, of oppression and the ideas of how culture can be very oppressive right, at times. And then the final stanza, all runaways wear dresses. Now, much has been made of the fact it's not clear who the speaker of this poem is, if the speaker is male or female. This may be the case that we have males being forced to wear dresses, or it may just be that we're a female speaker here speaking about having to wear the, the color of shame, namely green, right? And why green? I mean, what is it about green that is the color of shame, we might, we might ask? And then finally notice the attempt to try and scrub, to whitewash the sidewalks down. Again, it's shameful work. Our brushes cut the stone. Now, what's up with stone? I mean, we commented on this when we did our T.S. Eliot's Hollow Man, um, lips that would kiss, form prayers to broken stone. And the idea that stone is usually representative of that which lasts, which is why we build cathedrals in stone in Europe, right? The idea that stone is the attempt to monumentize, if I can invent that word, to create some kind of sense of monument of what's going on. And notice here, now we're back to the idea of stone and sidewalks and somehow cleaning it, right? Our brushes cut the stone in watered arcs and in the soak frail outlines shiver, brilliant verb here, clear, a moment, like a glimpse, things us kids pressed on the dark face before it hardened. We're back to the dreaming of the opening lines. Pale. And then the quest to remember. Remembering delicate, old injuries. And then finally, the spines of names and leaves. The forgotten. That is to say, the tragedy that one runs away to try to escape. One is brought back. There is no escape. The dominance of one culture will lead to the forgottenness of another culture, of course, tragically. At 2A, 
major messages here, obviously, the sad destruction of one culture over another is a clear message. Also, it's hard to forget what you can't remember. Some of you have written that line down when we meet this poem. It's hard to forget what you can't remember. And to that degree, here is a, a serious tragedy. I told you this is a poem that will lead to us feeling lugubrious, mournful, sad, right? At 2B, notice the symbolism of trains, the symbolism of clothes, powerful representations through dreams. We could do a whole Jungian read and, and, and the archetypes of this poem as well. At 3A, I mentioned Frost's death of the hired man. I want us to, uh, to put at 3A as well um, the short story that we studied in uh, Chapter 5, uh, uh, Blue and Dancing, as well as Sherman Alexie's on the Amtrak from Boston to New York on page 716. You can go back and take a look at our comments on both of those titles. Finally, at 3B, what was a time in your life when you were forced to return to something that you really loathe, that you really hated. Some of you are smiling because you'll say, well, it happens every school year when we have to begin again. How about this one? How has your education been an attempt to make you forget what you maybe never even could have remembered in the first place? And to what degree have you been wounded then by your education? I think that's an important question for us. Uh, as we uh, end our high school education and begin our university education to ask a question like that. I hope this study will lead you to more of er um, Erdrich's work. He's quite, quite a remarkable poet. Thank you.